Wake up, Wolfville, and welcome to Morning Bed Talk with Sarah and Robin, the show that explores inclusive education practices through discussion and debate. On today's show, we will introduce the concept of culturally responsive teaching and speak to an educator about their experiences with respect to this topic. I have to admit, when I first heard the term culturally responsive education, I wasn't sure of what it meant or how it could be implemented in the classroom. But when I came to talk to Sarah, we both found out that culturally responsive teaching is defined as a pedagogy that recognizes the importance of including students' cultural references in all aspects of their learning, and its importance has been widely recognized. Educators want to make a difference and empower their students, but it seems like an overwhelming task when considering the number of different cultural backgrounds that may exist in a classroom. Sarah went off-site to talk to a Jean Voisey, who was an educator who has been able to put the concept of inclusion through culturally responsive teaching into practice in their classroom. You have many years of experience as an educator. Most recently, you've spent 13 years as the inclusive schooling consultant for the Katikmiat region in Nunavut. You may, must have noticed many differences, including the culture of the students and staff in the schools that you visited. What was the biggest challenge with respect to the cultural differences that you experienced? The biggest challenge for me was, first of all, I was in the minority. And that was quite a shock when I went up in the beginning. And I realized that I had to become a learner and really learn from the people there about their culture, their way of life, and how things went. I mean, I couldn't go in being a know-it-all. It was so important that I became more a part of them. And how did you demonstrate that you had a genuine interest in their culture? Well, I, I took part in the activities that were happening in the community when I was there. I traveled a lot because I was going from one school to the other, and that doesn't sound like much, but in the north it means getting on a plane instead of a car and you're a week away. But when I was in my own community, I spent time with the people. Any community event that was taking place, I was there. If they asked me to go out fishing with them, even though I'd never fished in my life, I went and fished with them. Um, if they wanted to take me out on the land in the skidoo, I would go with them. And there was a sewing class going on, traditional sewing class in the evenings, where you scraped the fur and you made a parka. I took part in that because then you're there, you're talking to the people, they see that you're interested and then they really, you become part of them and they accept you much more too. Yes, it must have been helpful to have that experience or those connections to be accepted within the school system as oh, well. It was so important because they'd welcome you if once they saw it. And um, I can even give you an example. I, they were so used to people coming in and leaving, you know, so quickly. And um, after I was three years in my home-based community, when I returned after being home to Nova Scotia for the summer, um, I had three or four of them come up and hug me and welcome me home. Right. So right. I knew then that they were realizing I wasn't there just... For a short time. Um, you had the opportunity to visit many different classrooms and observe different educators. Can you provide a positive example of inclusion through culturally responsive teaching? Yes. Um, well, there's so many that I saw. The key is, um, in my case... Uh, non-Inuit were the minority, the Inuit or the, were the minor, uh, majority. And what I had to really think out very carefully, I'd have to look for things and make sure that the non-Inuit were included, but that the culture was Inuit because that was the majority culture. And I just saw so many positive things. I mean, displays are key, making sure the... Um, the writing system is called syllabics, that their system, their nuktatut was written in syllabics on displays, uh, that there wasn't just um, non-Inuit in um, pictures that went up, that they included the Inuit and their culture. And one of the best examples was the kindergarten teacher. And believe it or not, I walked in the room. Uh, at first, I couldn't believe it. There wasn't a desk to be had. And you think, well, we say primary in Nova Scotia, 
um, there was rocks, little circles of rocks on the floor. And I thought, this is dangerous. That was my immediate reaction. But I stood back and watched. The children worked inside these little circles on the floor. They sat on the floor and the Inuit are much more comfortable on the floor because we got to go back to the igloos and think of how they lived. They lived on the floor. So it is very much a part of their culture to be on the floor. They're very comfortable. They eat on the floor. Uh, that's where they're comfortable. And so the kids were in their little circles, so content. And the teacher was incredible because that was a class. The, f the first few years they're supposed to be taught in the native language of Anuktitut. And the teacher made sure she spoke to me in Anuktitut, even though I couldn't really understand her. But later she explained those circles were the tents on the land, which the children would have been used to when they went out on the land. So I thought, what a neat way to bring the culture into the classroom. So you use an example of a teacher who obviously had um, was part of that culture or was Inuit herself. Do you have any examples of non-Inuit educators who um, may have had another way of bringing the culture into the classroom? Yes, again, I saw an incredible example. Um, this teacher, right from the day she arrived, really wanted to learn the culture. And I think that's key. If the, t if the teachers feel that they want to learn and make sure all children are inclu included in a culture, they've got to learn the ways of that culture. And this teacher did that. And then when I walked in her room later on, I discovered she had a seal on the floor and an elder had come in and he was explaining to the kids how to cut the seal appropriately and the parts of the seal and how different parts of the seal were used. And I thought, wow, this is so important for the kids in their future. So she may have not had the knowledge herself, but she was able to draw on somebody resources. in the community and bring them in and realize, you know, that this is what the children needed. Mm -hmm. What are your final thoughts on the importance of culturally responsive teaching? First of all, I think it's key for every child. Every child has to realize that their culture has value. And for us as teachers, we've really got to become the lifelong learners. And if we've got children from two or three cultures in our classroom, it's up to us to learn something about their culture. Make sure we include it in our teaching so that they see that they're just as valued as everybody else. Thank you so much for taking the time to share your knowledge and your experiences with us. Um, I know that I have learned a lot and I'm sure many other people will, will learn from what you had to say. Thank you. Well, thank you so much, Sarah and Jean, for that wonderful interview. It's really great and inspiring to hear the many different ways to incorporate culture in your classroom. If you aren't comfortable teaching it yourself, well, just bring someone in from the community. I'm sure the kids would love to see that. And the community member would enjoy themselves as well. We would like to thank all of our listeners for joining us today, and I hope that you come back next week for more discussion on culturally relevant teaching. We will be introducing a number of practical suggestions for reshaping traditional curriculum to reflect the cultural backgrounds of students. And wake up, Wolf Phil, your morning bed talk.